Hey everybody, welcome to The Future. On today's episode, we're gonna talk about personal branding and how that's different, why it's relevant, and to tie it to many things that you didn't even think were relevant to you. We go on a deep dive, we explore the spiritual aspect of it, we talk about woo, am I woo or not? And in order to, for you to find out, you'll have to stick around. Chris, you and I have done this dance multiple times. Consider this like another layer in the onion, okay? Personal branding is a very, very hot topic in the social space, but also I feel like it's a word that's coming up in the collective consciousness right now, right? It and is. everybody feels very yeah. strongly about doing it because they see the upside of people that do it really well. People like yourself, other entrepreneurs, celebrities, and so forth. I see that many of them that are trying to do it, and this is no shame on them, are missing key components for doing it successfully. So I wanna start here just to get a lay of the land for people to understand. You use the term, there's a business brand or a corporate brand, and then there's a personal brand. Just walk me through, what does it mean to be a corporate brand? And then we'll tackle, what does it mean for you to be a personal brand? Branding and personal branding is super hot right now. You can't uh, go to a bookstore, you can't throw a stone in a circle of people and somebody's not talking about branding or personal branding. And branding has been a buzzword for quite some time. So there's more familiarity around that term and that and how people use it. Even still within creative circles, the word branding has a lot of misunderstanding. People think branding is what things look like. And that's a small part of it. Let's kind of think about it. Branding is the act of influencing positive associations with your product, service, or organization. Marty Neumeyer describes it as a person's gut feeling. And I think that's pretty good. Jeff Bezos says, it's what people say when you're not in the room. So that's your reputation. Dr. Christine Lucer says, it is impression management. So we take an impression of all those understandings. I think we start to understand that branding cannot be just what it looks like, because what it looks like is very superficial. There's what it does. Does it perform as, as promised? It's, there's the after service, like after the sale, what happens? There's the culture of the company because you can make a great product, provide a great solution to people, but anytime they run into anybody from the company, they're all like, they act like jerks or a-holes, then that's the brand. And that's why the late Tony Shea says in his book, Delivering Happiness, forget brand, get the culture right. When you get the culture right, the brand follows. There's a lot of truth to that because brand emanates from within. Now in the corporate space, what people have tried to do in the last... I, I think about 50 or so years is to influence via advertising the impression or the associations that people have with them. And for a period of time, they can do this because there were mostly there's three major networks, a few newspapers and a couple of magazines. And through the distribution and repetition of message ingrained within us from the moment we can we're cognizant that, like, say, for example, Coca-Cola, refreshing the world, so to speak, have a Coke and a smile then we start to associate those ideas together. But something wonderful has happened in the early 2000s, something called social media. Social media, for the first time, is a, a platform where we can have consumer-to-consumer, peer-to-peer conversations at scale and leverage our ability to network together and take away the power from the media companies. And there's been a seismic paradigm shift that's happened. This is why advertising has been in trouble for the last 20 plus years. And it's eroding. What do companies do now? If you can't control it, now you actually have to live up to the promises that you've made. But here's the mistake that people make. They have a lot of examples of what Nike is doing, how Apple markets and how they build a brand or say the Four Seasons. We see that and we're like, oh, we will do that. And so what we're doing is we're copying what we have perceived as what branding, large brands do, which is making advertising. We say like, well, I have a following. I put out a lot of content, therefore I have a personal brand. You you have a personal brand for sure, but it's not what the one that you think of. Because all you have to do is say, what do we think of these names? Donald Trump, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Brene Brown, Simon Sinek, Gary Vaynerchuk. And our association, our opinions about them, if there's enough of us, is really the brand and not what they say it is and not what they pretend it to be. When it's incongruous with what they say and do, with our perceptions of what they say and do, then we think, oh my gosh, you're so inauthentic. And now we have the rise of the personal brand, right? In the search for authenticity. Brands, big brands, corporate brands are in business. And we have to remember that they're in business to do what? To sell more products and services at a higher price to more people and to be able to dominate the market. So they're looking at this as more of a transactional play. So this was where a term you're, you're going to want to write down if you're unfamiliar with it. It's called performance marketing or 
direct to consumer performance marketing. And we understand that when you get a flyer in the mail, they're not really trying to build rapport with you. They're trying to sell you something. That's direct marketing. And if you look at ads that are being run on Facebook, on Instagram, or on TikTok, they're demo, demoing a product or something like that. They want you to buy it. And so we as humans are now saying, well, that's what I want. I, I want to make a living too. And so we emulate what they're doing. And this is really where it's problematic because what performance marketing, direct marketing is doing, it's pushing people away. Believe it or not, we will take your money. We're not really in it for the long term with you because we need the money right now. So don't get me wrong. Performance marketing is good for short term revenue, but it comes at the cost of long term brand value. We just need to remember this and let's do a quick test. Reflect on the campaigns that are popping up in your social feeds, the things that interrupt you while you're watching a YouTube video. Do you have positive associations with these companies or do you have negative ones? Even companies that you love, because I love a lot of companies, when they keep marketing to me when I'm not in a state to buy, it's really annoying. It's incessant, actually. And I, I always joke around. I say, I'm the world's best consumer because I'll buy anything. I'll sign up for all your programs. I'm one of the rare people who will fill out the surveys afterward and give you a five-star review. I'm your guy. I actively sign up for campaigns, mostly because I'm curious, but I hope that they treat me with respect and value what it is that I do. But what do they do, Mo? What they do is they are just bombing, carpet bombing, actually, in my inbox all the time. Last chance, new deals just for you. I'm like, how's this just for me? This is all women's clothing. Are you guys even <laughs> paying attention to me? I've given you permission to market to me, right. and all you do is you've abused it with generic uh, not specific, not tailored, and unwanted marketing. So now my my feeling is like I am a half click away from unsubscribing and saying I'm done with you. I'm going to move on to the next company that wants to support me in this way. So we definitely don't want to follow those those techniques that are being used by large companies because hey, we're not a large company. And the irony of ironies is this: is that the large companies are trying to be more personal. They're trying to sound like a real human. They can't because it's a team of strategists, marketers, attorneys, copywriters, art directors trying to like shape a message and make sure it runs by HR and to make sure that it's, it's hitting the key demos. You see, so it's like a big group think trying to communicate something. And it's coming across so many touch points because they communicate at volume. So think about it. Like, Does Nike have one copywriter? Clearly, they don't. They have hundreds, maybe thousands of copywriters dealing with national, regional, and, and web campaigns. They're doing this all the time, nonstop. How is it that, unless it's like a beehive, how could the hive be able to write in a consistent voice with a singular philosophy or focus and set of values? They can't because humans are humans and we have our own biases. We have different interpretations of things. So even if you and I were looking at an orange painting, you're like, that's not orange, bro. I'm like, what do you mean? You're like, it's tangerine. And someone else walks over and taps us on the shoulder. It's like, you guys must be colorblind. It's gold. No, no, it's, it's persimmon. We're all looking at exactly the same thing, as simple as an orange painting. And we can't even agree. So how can we agree who the heck we are? Don't make this mistake. If you're a human being and you're emulating the steps of large corporations, you're already shooting yourself in the foot because it's going to be a situation where the dog chases its tail. You want to act like big corporations. Corporations want to act like people. So you're just like going in this weird circle. Just stop and you're already there where you're supposed to be. Instead of going like this, back to here, just stay there. That's where you're supposed to be, to lean into who you are. I literally have goosebumps around this conversation because I think this is the first time I've heard you say it like this and I want to spotlight it. Corporations are trying to be human. You're trying to be a big corporation and you already have the upside of not being a big corporation to succeed as a personal brand. And on top of that, I think this stems from the syndrome of like the grass is greener on the other side, right? People are not present in what they have. People are looking at what they could be, what they want to be. And they forget that there's a huge gap. Like someone like myself who has a small business, a small personal brand. If I try to even emulate what Nike is doing at the scale that they're doing, I might like an ad that they pulled off or a campaign that they pulled off, but one resources two capital, Three, it's going to look, like you said, incongruent. So I really want the people that are listening to spotlight this. What you're chasing 
is opposite of what you can do. I don't think that it is the case of grass is greener. I think this is the case of you are dumber than you think you are. Okay, and I'll tell you what it looks like. Let me illustrate this for you. Everybody imagine this. Imagine you're a monkey and you have a hammer in your hand and you're afraid of snakes and you see something on the ground and you think it's a snake. You know what that is? It's your tail and you smash it with a hammer and they're like, oh my God, that hurts. And that's what you're doing because you're not a student of branding. And that's okay because Professor D is in the house with Mr. M. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to help you with this. Okay, we're going to help you with this. So I am a student of the game. I study advertising. I study branding. And I don't just study like I look at and read a book. I'm like really saying, what's happening emotionally to me right now? Why am I acting so irrationally? Why am I going to bat for this company? Why am I, you know, when people are like, um, yeah, I use um, a Google Pixel or a Samsung Galaxy. And my immediate reaction is we can't be friends now, can we? That's a fact. You've heard me say this, right? Forget about it. I'm not, I'm not interested in talking to you because I'm a design snob. And I say, my world revolves around a few companies and Apple's one of them. I will happily admit I'm an Apple fanboy. A less nice term is an Apple nut hugger. So they have an emotional hook on me. And there's a real reason why and we can explore it is. I was mentioning to our mutual friend, Rodrigo, that I'm going to write a post. And the post is going to be, Nike doesn't sell shoes. They're like, what the F kind of clickbait is this? Nike does not sell shoes and you are not buying shoes. They make shoes. They're not selling shoes. They're selling an idea. They're selling an opportunity for you to enroll in a tribe of like-minded people. And Marty Numa writes about this in his book, Brand Flip, is that people don't buy products. They join tribes. It used to be that the companies own brands. Now consumers own the brand because it's what we say it is. What is it that Nike is really selling then? So they're selling this idea and I'm ready to be challenged on this, but I haven't heard a better explanation. So here I go. What Nike is selling to you is this idea that within all of us is the heart of a champion, that we are all capable of more than what we give ourselves credit and that we can tap into human achievement. It's embodied by these modern day gladiators, Serena Williams, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Roger Federer, because they've achieved the top of their game. And they're not telling you by wearing these shoes or putting on these goggles that you can be Michael Phelps. It doesn't work like that. But what they're saying is that these are all just human beings, just like you and me. And whether you're 255 pounds or you're 105 pounds soaking wet, Within all of us, there's the potential for human greatness. And that's why we wear the Nike badge. And I take it back, and I was talking to Rodrigo about this. Like, do you know some of the earliest uses of brand and design? It's in war. Let's think about it. We are neighboring tribes, and we're not friends. We're bitter rivals. So what we do is we have skirmishes, and then we enter into war. How do my people know that we're not killing our own people? Because clearly, when there's thousands of people on the field, we don't know who we're killing. Yeah, now traditional warfare is we face a direction. So if you're facing the wrong direction, you're going to get stabbed, right? And there are things that you can tell. Let's talk about it. Your suit of armor. So in the old days, it would be leather, and then you'd go up to chain mail and then plate mail and all kinds of armor, right? Well, the design of our armor is going to be different than your armor, the suit that you wear. And think about it. The shirt that you wear from Nike looks different than the shirt you wear from Adidas. And then what do they do? They're like, boys, and they hit the drum, bum, 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 bum. And we're going to start marching, right? And then they yell, raise the banners. And there are people's jobs and all they're doing, they're going to get killed on the field because they have no weapon. They're holding a staff with a flag. The flag has certain colors, it has a certain shape. And then we wear the shape and the colors too so that we know we are a tribe and we're literally at war with the other tribe. Okay, now fast forward a couple thousand years. What is our tribe? So when you're walking down the street with your iPhone, whatever, and somebody's walking by with their Android phone, you're like, no, oh, you're that tribe. Yeah, yeah, right? Just like you go to the steakhouse, you're like, I'm part of this tribe. I'm part of the carnivores club. And the vegans walk by and like, oh, you're a barbarian. And they're righteously indignant about you eating something with a with a face. So we're we're kind of not in a physical war, but we're signaling to people all the time who we are, what our values are, and we want to be around people who are like us. Because to be ostracized within a social network is almost certain doom. There's safety numbers. There is community. There's connection. There's a sense of belonging, sense of status. Your physical and emotional well-being can be heavily influenced 
by the people that you're around, especially if you feel really isolated. You know, the people who, who are serial killers? Well, I've seen a couple of portraits and they're all hot right now in documentaries, right? The one thing that you can find that's pretty common with them is a sense of isolation. They just, whether they are literally isolated or not, they feel this way. And it's a dangerous state to be in for all of us because this human existence, I think, is, is really tough when you feel like you're the only person and what you do doesn't matter. You know, Erwin McManus, I saw him speak. He's a pastor and he runs a mega church here in Hollywood and it called Mosaic. It's very non-traditional. And I'd heard about him, but I don't know anything about him. He was just, I, I think he had something prepared, but it felt like he was just pulling from the ether, tapping into a higher source. You would expect that from a pastor. And he tells his story. He says, there's a, I, I hope I'm not butchering this and I'll look it up after the fact but a bunch of Japanese scientists who were studying the phenomenon of language and voice and power because he was talking a lot about voice. So he says they took three vats of cooked rice and with one vat, a bunch of monks came by and they would yell or shout positive affirmations and the cooked rice fermented and, and turned into wine. And then a different set of monks would come in and yell negative critical thoughts to a jar of rice and that thing rotted. And then there was a third jar of rice where they did nothing. That was their control. Do you know what happened to that jar of rice? It grew mold, just like the second one where it was yelled at, but it grew mold twice as fast. So it turns out it's best to be praised. It's horrible to be criticized, but the worst possible thing is to be ignored, that you don't matter. That's a terribly dark place. And I found that story to be super powerful. This is uh, sparking my psych nerd. So we're going to take a little detour here before I go into the question that I want to ask. For those of you that want to read peer-reviewed journals, there's everything that Chris is saying is backed up by scholars Baumeister and Leary. Back in 95, they coined the term social belongingness. And in the past, during the caveman days and the Roman empires and all these kind of things, it's like the only reason why we've been able to succeed as a species compared to any other species is because of our ability to create groups. And in those groups, certain people have certain functions that empower the people that don't know that particular function. So if I'm good at farming, I'm part of this group while somebody else is a hunter, while somebody else is a cook, whatever that may be. It's interesting that what they found is the lack of social belongingness, that feeling of ostracism and isolation, literally the feeling physically is the equivalent of getting like punched or like physical pain. So what I'm hearing, these themes that I'm hearing from you is because we've evolved as a society, right? And there are definitely certain areas in the country that are still very much struggling cut in the, in the globe. So I'm not diminishing that. But in a capitalistic society like the United States where there's a lot of privilege, we're finding social belongingness through this sense of branding. Because I was in Egypt for seven months and it's really interesting how only the super upper echelon even cared about branding, right? But in the States, it's like every little thing is a brand from the ketchup to the garbage bag to the clothing. Like in Egypt, it's like, this is a garbage bag. It's not a heavy duty lemon scented, like it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna grab a garbage bag, right? But the people that are up there who have that means, who have that privilege, are very focused on like, okay, I'm gonna buy this particular thing because one, I can afford it. And two, it signals to the world that I am someone with discretionary income, whatever it may be. So I find it interesting that we're seeking this concept of social belongingness through the clothes we wear, like you, through the uh, merchandise that you buy, through the technology that you buy, because we're constantly craving it to feel like we belong, to feel like we're a part of something bigger. What I'm troubled with about this like resurgence of personal branding is the people that are doing it wrong and the people that fall for it are getting hurt because of it, in my opinion. And you see it up and down in the coaching space. You see it up and down in the marketing space, particularly digital marketing. So I want to circle back to something that you said earlier, where you said transactional is performance marketing, where the goal is to get people to buy right? Sales, 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 sales. I feel like your experience with those that do that is off-putting for you because you are a brand snob. Because I see these same companies making a lot of freaking money, having a tremendous amount of business success. So one could argue that if, as the business is elevating, they're getting more capital, they can allocate those resources to improving the branding if they don't know how to do it just yet. What are your thoughts about that pocket where it's like, well, Chris, 
we got to make money. You know what I'm saying? We got to we got to build revenue. This branding thing is super nice. It sounds kind of esoteric, right? It sounds a little woo woo, right? It's a long-term play. We'll get there. What do you tell those folks? What do you tell those businesses? And what's your response to that? Because I think you are a brand snob, just saying. I, I take umbrage with that term that you used on me, calling me a brand snob. I just want to put it out there. I'm just a snob, oh, okay, period. Okay, <laughs> you don't have to wear the word brand. <laughs> yeah. Let's kind of unpack a bunch of things because I'm sure the whoever's watching or listening to this later, they're sitting there and like, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced about what you're saying, Chris. It's not true. This idea that being ignored is like the worst thing that could happen. I'm going to share something with you that I learned from my family therapist. So my children at that point are pretty young. My oldest is going through a pretty rough time. He skipped the terrible twos. I think he he rolled into the fearsome four. So when he was four and more articulate, he was having these tantrums that were just uncontrollable, screaming, crying fast, where he was throwing things around. It was just a horrible thing. And I was feeling slowly, I was losing influence over my own child. And it was impacting my relationship with my wife because I think I'm a bad parent now. I'm having dark thoughts about my own children. Like, I just want to smack you right now because I'm losing patience. And I don't know. And I'm dragged into these drawn up fights between him and my wife that they both are so drawn in, in the sand that they cannot move from their position. Simple acts of us going out to eat or doing simple, simple things became traumatic ordeals. So I do what most people do in my situation. I cried for help. I went to find help. And I want to put a flag in the ground so that people can follow the clues here, okay? Is that oftentimes when you're stuck in your life and you're building your brand or your business, you're, you can't get to sale, whatever's happening, you just need to know help is around the corner. You have to be willing to ask for it, to seek it out, to be able to articulate what you're looking for, and then to put in the work. So I found a family therapist right away. And I went to Joan and I said, hey, I got this problem. I just feel like I'm not going to be a good father. And I'm just doing everything that I can not to become old school Asian father and just whip my children. Because I don't believe that's necessary unless it's necessary. And it's not necessary right now. And she explained something to me. She explained a couple of different concepts to me. And I think are not just powerful, but they're transformative. I'm going to share it with you right now, dear audience. I'm going to share it with you right now. She says that children, when they act up, crave attention. They prefer positive attention, but they'll take negative attention. And I was sitting there thinking, that cannot be true. No child wants to be yelled at and reprimanded and argued with. And I'm like, this cannot be true. I know I want to receive positive attention, but negative attention? So she says, the best way to resolve this is to starve them of the attention. Because what they're doing is they're seeing, if I behave this way, I will get what I want. Not the outcome that I want, but the attention that I want. So then she told me, the next time he acts up, I want you to say this. And you know what? I went to the room. I did exactly as I was told because I'm a really good student. I didn't try to improvise. I didn't try to like flip it. I'm like, I just came in there like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to do it exactly as I'm instructed because... If, if it doesn't work, at least I can go back to Joan and say, Joan, I did exactly what you said. This is a bunch of BS. This doesn't work. Tell me what really works now. But to my surprise, I did exactly what she said, and it stopped. And it didn't stop like in five tries. It stopped in one try. This is like, you know, one of those movies, I forget which one it is, but like say you're a sharpshooter and you're like a mile and a half away from Target and you shoot through a car window, through a bus, through like between somebody doing uh, jumping jacks and eventually it just hits a target one shot and there's a little bit of smoke and a little bit of recoil from the gun. That's what she did. She gave me that bullet one shot and that was it. And if you guys want to know what she told me to do, that's a story for another day. It's how I'm going to tease you. You're like, no! Why would you do that to us? Why? Why? No, I'll tell you guys. All right. As you're probably like spitting coffee or your, your beverage of choice out at the screen, I don't want to do that to you. I will tell you. I will share what I spent money to learn with you because that's in the spirit of generosity because I, I want to build an emotional connection with you. I don't want to make this transactional. See what I'm doing here? There's a lot of meta layers to pull back. You know what? Hold on. Before he says anything, because he doesn't ask usually, all right? Because he's sharing this and we're not putting another, press the subscribe button, all right? That's what we want right now. We want you to press the subscribe button so you can get what he paid for, for to free. I'm going to do my part, okay? Because this is the idea of reciprocity. I know you're going to like, comment, and subscribe. So 
I'm going to assume you've done so. I'm going to, I'm going to lead with, with generosity here. Here's what she told me to do. She says, walk in the room. Well, before she did that, let me tell you what she really said. She goes, why, why are you checking out on your son? I see, because I hear the yelling and the screaming and it hurts my soul. As a father, I just want to take care of my children. I love my children. I love them more than my own life. I would lay down my life in an instant. So you're checking in on them because you care about them. Okay. Here's what you do. She says, say this exact thing. Like you can just look at your watch. Okay, today's Tuesday. It's going to happen. And then boom, two days later, explosion. Over things I don't even know about. All I hear is crying and yelling and screaming. And then a slam in the door. Boom, boom. It happens just like that every single time. And I look at my wife. She's like fuming. I'm like, I got this. Pop the collar. I got this, babe. So I go in there. I knock on the door. Three knocks. And I open. That's the standard dough household protocol. Whether you're a child or an adult. I'm going to knock to warn you. He's yelling, he's screaming. And you know, he would say very violent things to me. He would say things like, I don't love you. Get out of here. I hate you. And that hurt me. I know he's a child and I know I'm an adult and he's, he doesn't mean any of this. He's just acting very emotionally, but I could feel it. And it's like daggers stabbing into me and I'm trying my best not to react. So I go in there. I know it's going to happen. I, and I stop him. He said, hey, buddy, I heard you crying from downstairs. I came in to check in on you because I care about you. I see that you're upset. I'm going to leave in two seconds. I think you're okay. And if you want to talk, just come find me. I just walk out the door. So what, do we, what, what, what has happened here? What has happened here? And I, I went downstairs. I could still hear him screaming and yelling. And then I, I sat down on the couch, like reading my book or magazine. And then 10 seconds, nine seconds, three seconds, done. Door opens up. He kind of gingerly steps out looking around. No one's yelling at him. No one's chasing after him. He walks downstairs and he pretends like nothing has happened. And that was the last time he did that. Okay. So number one, you led from a place of accountability for yourself, right? You said, I want to check in on you. You didn't lead with like, what are you doing? You, you, you. So there's a lot of helpful communication, nonviolent communication. Number two, you gave him autonomy to choose, which I think, I think that's brilliant. And if we're connecting it to branding, when you said earlier, people decide what you are as a brand, not what you force them into believing. You gave him that choice of like, okay, you can continue like this. I'm here if you want to come. So I love that. And number three, I think what you did is acknowledge his, whether you want to call it a wound of not getting attention by saying, I care about you. That's why I'm coming in here. That's my actual reason. And then the last thing is you gave him his space to process what was going on. That's what I understood from all of that. Yeah, I think you're missing one critical component. Of course I am. <laughs> but it is a really critical component here. And once you understand this, then you can see like, whoa, okay. So what I'm doing is I'm acknowledging he's going through something. I'm expressing that I care. And I rob him of his ability to tell me to go away because I said, I'm leaving. And that was the critical part because in his mind, it's like, I want you to leave now. So I'm going to say really nasty things to get you to leave because no parent's going to sit there and have their child scream and yell horrible things at them, right? So I came in. I said, hey, I see that you're upset. I want to make sure you're okay. It looks like you're okay, so I'm going to leave. I'll be downstairs if you want to talk. So I'm giving him grace. There's no accusations. The critical part is I'm going to ignore you. You cannot push me away. So I'm starving him of exactly what he wanted, which was for someone to go in there and either appease him praise him or criticize him. And in the past, I'd say, oh, so why are you doing this? Let's have a talk. You know how mom is. And he doesn't want to hear any of that. And, you know, were you in the right here? Were you in the wrong? They don't want to hear that. And that's why they're going to say negative things to drive you out. And then you'll argue with them even more. And that's what they want. Subconsciously, it's what they want. They just want your attention. And so I left. And that ended that. Now, there are other ninja level nanny master trickery that she taught me. I was like, wow, does this work in real life? Well, okay. For those of you that are watching that are single or don't have children, like, I don't know how to test this. Well, I'm going to give you one more thing and we're going to move on. I'm going to answer the questions that Mel brought up, which is this. You know, when you get into dispute with your partner, hey. they can yell at you. They can praise you. But you know what's worst of all? They give you the old silent treatment. Like you exist, but you don't exist. They walk past you. They don't acknowledge you. You say something, they don't say anything back. And that's one form of withholding love is to ignore you. Now, I personally don't prescribe to that way of behaving. Some people do. But I'm let you, letting you know how powerful it is to be ignored. And that's going to take us home to this point, the cooked rice. So we would love to be praised when we make content online. Be showered with adulation, likes, engagement, sharing, 
virality, followers, all that kind of stuff. We're a little nervous about getting yelled at by trolls, canceling us, scolding us, judging us. But what we don't want is for no one to care. Because when people complain to me, there are a couple of people in their comments saying nasty things. I said, you should be so fortunate. They're like, what? Why would I be fortunate for people hating on me right now? Well, let me ask you, what if no one responded? They're like, <clears throat> goes back to that thing. Okay, let's go into the next part here. This idea of like in different countries, we have the privilege of worrying about identity. Well, when we don't have our basic needs met, let's get into Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the very bottom are our physiological needs, food, water, shelter, clothing. Without that, we cannot survive. So clearly, if you're huddled up in a cave somewhere and bombs are being dropped overhead, you're not sitting there thinking, who am I? What makes me me? What do I care about brands for? Because you're just thinking, where do I go to the bathroom? How to get clean water? And how will I be alive tomorrow? So that's clear, right? We don't have the luxury of thinking about our own existence because we're just trying to survive. 90 to 100% of our physiological, mental kind of processing power is spent on staying alive, rationing food, all the kinds of things, trying to make a fire, staying warm, uh, protecting ourselves from dangerous animals and poisonous creatures. That's what it should be. As we ascend Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you get into belonging, connectedness, and then you get into relationships and things like that. But at the very top is this thing, it's called self-actualization, which is a really complicated way to say something, like to achieve your human potential. And what does that even mean? So I just look at the top of the pyramid is something called identity. Who am I? And that's a question you're going to be asking yourself until you die. Who am I? Now, I think the spiritual leaders, the gurus, the shamans, the, the medicine witch doctors, they have figured out who they are. And it's a very attractive thing. We're drawn to them because they seem so calm, stoic. They're comfortable in their own skin. When everyone else is running around like kind of trying to scratch off their layer of skin because they just don't like themselves, these people are magnetic. They draw them, draw others to them. Unfortunately, sometimes these people are aware of this and they turn into con artists. They, they turn into religious leaders for and they leverage this charisma for the wrong reasons to start holy wars. They become politicians who are for ill-gotten gains. We're trying to be enlightened, comfortable in our own skin, but not to manipulate others for our own good. And this runs into a lot of challenges for me personally, because it doesn't align with my set of values. You say, it sounds a little woo-woo, Chris. I wanna make money right now. I'm the least woo person you're ever going to meet. I really am. All you have to do is spend a little time talking to my wife. You know, whenever I'm like, I got to go to work. And she's like, what do you mean? Oh, you're so stuck by physical reality. I'm like, babe, I live in physical reality. I don't know about you. <laughs> but, you know, when when the bill collectors come, I'm telling you, they're not traveling on the I astral plane. <laughs> I can't cash woo checks right now. I got to be in the physical reality. So I'm a very pragmatic, practical person. It doesn't mean... I'm closed-minded about the things that we can't understand or process. I'm very open to that, but not to the point of absurdity where I'm like, that's your explanation. The more logical explanation as to why you missed the bus was because you got up late and you didn't prepare. It's not because some universal forces aligned to not allow you to get on the bus. The simplest, most obvious explanation is usually the correct one. Let's get back into it. What are we all doing right now? I think we're all selling something all the time. Maybe I'm selling you on the idea that I'm not selling you. And that in itself is a sale. And other people are much more clear and transparent and they're thinking on a much shorter time frame. I'm not gonna lie to all of you. I'm selling you something too. It just exists on a much longer time frame. So when we th think about transactional, we think about right now, quid pro quo. Quid pro quo, I tell you things, you tell me things. You give me something, I do something. You give me something, I do something. And it's over. Think about all your deepest friendships, the ones that you've had since childhood, if you're so lucky. Or maybe in your adult life, you've come to hang out with some peers or work friends, and you have a deep, deep connection. You travel together. If you need help, they're, they're there to pick you up at the airport. They'll help you pack. They'll do whatever. And you will do the same for them. You could say that's transactional, but it's existing on a much, much longer time frame. So somewhere along the way, you and Bobby became friends. 
and Bobby was being picked on and you stepped in to say, hey, if you're going to have to fight Bobby, you're going to have to fight me too. And why did you do that? Because you care about people, but also because there's safety in numbers. Because maybe you think one day, I'm going to need Bobby to be there in my corner too. There's safety in numbers, right? Apart, we're not so strong. Together, we're much stronger. And then one day, you're testing the friendship and somebody tries to do something to you and Bobby does not step up. So what it is, is you, you made a promise to each other and Bobby broke the promise. So you're not going to develop a deep relationship with Bobby if you're smart. Sadly, a lot of us exist in a space where, oh, it's okay. Bobby doesn't have to do that. It's okay. You know, who am I to expect these kinds of things? We don't have that same level of self-love, self-awareness, and self-confidence. So we we make excuses for the other person, not holding up their end of the bargain. Like we're in some part of covenant. You know, the covenant of the rings. We're all going to go to the mountain and we're going to try to destroy this ring together. We're all trying to move together in the in the school of life and things will happen are we there for each other or not? Okay, so when you buy widget from company X, there's no covenant. The covenant is, I'm gonna swipe my credit card, you take my money, and you ship me the product undamaged the way you, you said you were going to. End the covenant. Tomorrow when said company is needing money because uh, they're gonna go bankrupt, and they say, well, everybody who loves our products, please buy something, you may or may not feel compelled to do that. You might, you might not, I don't know. Let's let's change the scenario a little bit. Let's say there's a local coffee shop and you know the owners. It's Becky and Bob and they're an older couple and they've lived in the neighborhood. They're multi-generational in the neighborhood. And you know what? Their coffee ain't that great. Their, their decor isn't that great. Their coffee costs a little bit more than the local mass market chain. But you, feeling like you need to support people in the community and local businesses, you walk past three chains. And you go and you give your money to Bobby and Becky. And they greet you by name. They're like, hey, Mo. Hi, Chris. Usual today? Oh, you have some new friends. Is this your mom and dad? Oh, hi. Oh, where are you guys from? And so what they're doing is they're building connection with you. So when I told you earlier, Nike doesn't sell shoes. They're selling an idea. And so Bobby and Becky don't explicitly say by shopping here, you are supporting local communities and our business. It's implied. It's implicit. And they know that, okay? Because they want to keep the money in the neighborhood. This is very, very important because it's the only fight that you guys can fight against in terms of mass market chains coming in and taking over where the money is spent elsewhere. They're not keeping in the neighborhood. There's a relationship and you're building something over a longer period of time. If you do that consistently enough, you start to have genuine emotional connection. You start to have something called a brand. So yeah, what, it, what, it, what is the future selling to you? Whether you're listening to this on a podcast or you're watching this on a YouTube or, or maybe behind a paywall, I don't know. What, what are we selling to you? And I'm gonna pause here. I'm gonna ask Mo this question because everybody's selling something. What do you think the future is selling to you? I think simply you're selling education that isn't uh, debt inducing. But as a result of that education, you're equipping people to kind of achieve the lifestyle that they want via what they know how to do. I think that's, that's my understanding of it. So when you say you're selling education, give me a little bit clear, like paint a clearer picture because it sounds so, so abstract. What do, you, what do you really think we're selling? I think once a person is more educated, whether that's a specific skill set or mindset or technique they become empowered and from that level of empowerment they are able to then level up in their life whether that's making more money becoming a more personally developed person so not to sound corny but i think you are selling the the journey to self-actualization through education around a specific business a specific skill set a specific software this, what we're doing, that's what I believe you're selling. And especially based on how you move as the future, as a brand, that's what I think you're selling. Okay. You answered that question perfectly. <laughs> oh, thank you. you spoke about that in a in way that I think only you can. And that's what I like about you. It's like, there's an academic scholarly side. There's Mo, the hip hop artist. There's Mo, who's my friend. There's Mo, who helps us with content. And as Mo, the student of, uh, like a student of life right? So no one buys education, Mo. I mean, I don't know who likes education. They like what education does for them, right? We're not going there to, 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 cause we love paying tuition. That's not why 
we want something much deeper. And you you will start to understand the things that motivate people. I think there's only a handful of things, the core motivations, like belonging. What we're really selling here is empowerment. So what we do is we show up every single day. We, we write a piece of content. We record a video to empower you with information so that you can achieve your potential, your self-actualization, whatever that might mean to you. And we do this mostly for free. And somebody's going to argue, well, it's not totally for free. I'm like, yeah, you're getting really technical. You're missing the point, friend. And then the reason why they could say that is because YouTube gives us a couple of pennies for every view that we, we get. But it's not enough to sustain this operation. It's not enough to pay me what I'm worth in the free market. Forget about like all the other people have to be involved, like Mo and Drigo and Mo's team doing the thumbnails and the editing and the graphics and the explainer animations that you're doing. People need to get paid to do that. And so what we're getting paid from social platforms is a pittance compared to like what we can do in the corporate market. It would be a tiny fraction of what we could get if we just gated every piece of content. You all know this. You're here because of this. So if you're listening to this on a podcast, what is it we're selling? Well, and what is it that you're buying? Okay, so there are promises made. Remember, I said it's all promises, right? I make a promise to you. You promise back something to me. I promise to you I will be as transparent as possible and to tell you about the highs and the lows, that I will do my best to draw the very best from people when they're here as a guest, that if I learn something new, I will tell you what I'm learning as I'm learning it and to give you the full disclosure. I will do my best to honor and cite the references of the people that I can recall. If I can do that and do it consistently enough over time where you learn through me, then your promise is I'll keep watching and I'll keep listening. And if you want to go deeper in that promise, you, you say to yourself, I promise to tell more people because that helps you with your goal. We help each other. And then when there's a product or a community where you feel so inclined to do so at your own free will, not through some pressure tactic or we, me withholding stuff, you say, well, I'll buy that. I don't even need that and I'll buy it. I'll join your group and I'm not even going to show up. It doesn't matter because just like that coffee shop from Bobby and Becky, I want to make sure people like you are still around. And I'll tell you what hurts me a little bit here. There's a quote from Ana Lape. The dollars you spend is a vote for the world you want to live in. Okay, so when you frequent the chains, you're like, I would like more chains. I would like more faceless corporations that come into neighborhoods, compete in unfair ways against local owners because you have buying power. You can hire staff and you can do all kinds of weird stuff that a local business owner can't. They can open earlier, close later. They can have cleaner looking uniforms and branding. They can market and advertise. They have more resources. Or you can say, you know what? The coffee ain't as good. Costs a little bit more. But you know what? This aligns with who I am. And I'm not here to judge you. What I'm saying is be conscious that every dollar is a vote. What kind of world do you want to live in? So I put this out to you. And this hurts me when people literally say this to me in comments. I love what you do. You've helped me to make so much money. And they literally will tell me how much. Sometimes a few thousand bucks. Sometimes it'll be tens of thousands of dollars. And you know what they'll do? This is the ultimate insult to me. We just bought X and YZ's course and it's terrible. It's not even as good as your free stuff. When I'm sitting there thinking, what am I? Am I dog trash, Mo? We show up to support you, to help you, to give you the tools. I read lots of books. I talk to amazing, influential, super smart people. And as soon as I learn something, you know what I do? I run back to the community. It's like, you guys, you know, you know what I just learned? This happened behind a closed door that would cost thousands of dollars to get into. And I just shared it with you. They're thinking, well, Chris gave it to us for free. We don't pay for free things. But perhaps in the 21st century, 21st century, the new economy is really about generosity. And we can move away. We can be post-transactional. Let's get into this. Let's get into this. Because this always, yeah. this... I have a very close relationship with you. Like I have a privilege to see behind closed doors, yeah. hear about the business. I'm part of the business with you as far as our role as content yeah. team. I want to talk about when someone is on this journey like you, which you've been in the game now publicly, right? On social for about 10 years. Before that, 20 years in advertising, like there's a breadth of knowledge and I consider you the best at it. Whether you're the most known, that's not the point. I know, and this is not like biased, well, maybe it is a little biased. You're the best at it. If someone is on the same journey as you and you're seeing that you're giving so much generously, that you are not asking for anything in return, like there's a real true sense of altruism and a belief in reciprocity from you. And that's not happening from the other side. As you just mentioned, they're going and buying another course. They're going and hiring someone else for their talk. They Whatever. 
and it's negatively affecting your business. I'm not saying it's negatively affecting your business. I'm just saying that person, it ends up negatively affecting their business and then it affects them psychologically. They're like, fuck, like, what else do I got to do? It's like, I'm making the content. I'm giving things for free. I'm marketing ethically. I'm, I'm, I'm direct to consumer transaction when it's appropriate, just like the coffee house. And I'm not receiving that transaction. What does a person do? How do they pivot? They believe in the branding. They believe in the long game. They're doing the right things just like you are, but it's not yielding the results that they want. And they're so committed to playing the long-term game, but they're not seeing that short-term win to sustain it. What do they do? What do they need to hear right now? I'm going to answer this in the only way I can, which is from my perspective. And I want to give a couple caveats here. I'm in the game because I love to teach. I think my higher calling, my purpose, once I figured it out, is to teach and to teach in ways that only I can do. That's all. I'm trying to just help people connect with their values and to get them to be cognizant of their behaviors as it pertains to the kind of world they want to live in. This is where you're going to pin me down on the woo. I already know it. I set myself up for a trap. I believe in this. I believe in this idea that Jose shared with me called karmic equity. I've always believed in karma, but he gave it a term, which really helped me to understand it better. That when I was a young person, I was doing good because it felt good to do good. We understand that there's a lot of science and studies behind this, but you know what? I think your physical being changes when you have this mindset. I've tried this theory before and I've, I, I'm still trying to find evidence if it's not true. Anecdotally speaking, when you look at people and you look at their face, you're like, that's a kind person. That's a generous person. That's a thoughtful person. And you look at some people's faces, that is a selfish person. That person is out to take advantage of you. And you can see it in their face. And I just wonder, does the face betray the mind or does the mind betray the face? I'm not quite sure what's happening here. Do you know what I mean? You can look at some people and you're like, that person's a shyster. They're going to snake me. And then there's other people you're like, you know what? That person's all right. I feel pretty safe. Now, unfortunately, though, sociopaths, psychopaths know how to, because <laughs> they're convinced what they're doing is good, that their face looks really trustworthy. So just be mindful of that, okay? There's a rare percentage of people who can actually manipulate this because I believe, they believe it themselves. But so there's this idea of karma and karmic equity, that the more good that you do in life, the more opportunities disappear before you. Not on a one-to-one, -one, not on a timeline that you can predict, but here I am, I'm making videos now. We're, we're, we're on our 10th year of making content. And every day, new opportunities appear to me. I'm like, what did I do to deserve any of this? I don't even get it. So for me, that's my reward. And I'm in a very financially secure place. You would call it privilege, an earned privilege, I, I want to put out there, that I'm okay. And it makes me feel better to know that people who are less okay have at least a couple more tools that they can use to grow in their life and their business, to have stronger personal relationships, to be a better parent, whatever it is. If I have it and you want it, I'm going to just teach it. That's my gift and gifts have to be given, right? So you have a present. There's no point for you to hold the present in order for you to receive the joy of a gift. You got to give it to somebody. I feel like this evolved into really like kind of a spiritual, psychological mindset discussion. So I'm going to do my best here to share what I learned and you bridge the gap on anything. We'll end with one question and I want you to answer it very simply and concisely. But if you've made it to the end, thank you for your time and attention. I'm going to ask versus Chris because he usually doesn't because of how generous he is. Chris Wu doesn't ask. So uh, Mo Do is going to ask. If you found value in this and you've been following this series of what is now the third video around developing the importance and how to actually navigate a successful personal brand, I ask you to look into something called the Future Pro Group, which is a community of creative entrepreneurs that are trying to level up to go from zero to a hundred thousand business fundamentals, marketing fundamentals, sales fundamentals, and also getting that sense of belongingness as a community. I was a pro group member. I still am a pro group member. And I can tell you from just being a member and now my one-on-one -on -one with Chris and his mentorship and friendship, my business went from being a hundred thousand dollar business to being a half million dollar business directly from his mentorship. And I do not say that lightly. This man has absolutely changed my life, both spiritually, both mentally and professionally. I'm not someone that any time says you should do something. I don't believe in that language, but I encourage you, I invite you to visit the website that will be in the description below, or it's gonna show up in the info box and just 
learn about it. There is no harm in stepping in and taking that leap. It will absolutely transform your life. Okay. That's the pitch. That's what I got. Let's move on to the recap. So for someone to build a successful personal brand, Chris, this is what I learned. Bridge the gap at the end. Number one, you have to understand where you are as a professional, as a person on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you are someone who is needing things to survive, it may not be feasible for you to play this long game right now. Do it mentally, do it spiritually, but focus on building the business and driving revenue. Number two, some of the elements that are important is know what kind of business you are. If you are a small person, a small business, sorry, a solopreneur, focus on the things that big corporations can't do, which is the human side. This is showing a level of vulnerability, building connection, um, really dialing in the customer experience as far as, far as like communication, transparency showing up because a lot of these big corporations like the Nikes, like the Amazons, like the Adidas, right? Can't do what you do. So you are that small coffee shop. And then the last thing, and this is what I got from you, Chris, is there has to be a level of intentionality and consistency and resolve in this decision of yours to build a brand because it is a long game. It is a delayed gratification game where you're not going to see as much transactional results as fast as possible as you would like to. So you have to have a tremendous amount of resolve in doing this. And of course, be smart in incorporating transactions effectively so that law of reciprocity kicks in. My last question is for those that are still rocking with us, what is the first step that they need to just commit to? If it's something as small as writing in a journal, I'd love for you to say that. Try to answer it as concisely as possible to push themselves in the right direction of adopting this transformational personal brand building endeavor in their business. Okay. Before we can move forward, we must look to the past. We have to understand where you came from and the cultural currency that you inherited. What I'm talking about is figuring out your origin story. Where were you born? Who are your parents? Who are your early mentors in life? And they often offer you many clues as to who you really are. I think in the process of growing up, we forget because we, we socialize and we, we kind of conform to what's going on, that a lot of that gets plastered over. So I'm talking about from the earliest memory, usually it's around two to three years old to about seven years old, who you are and who you are has already been formed. Go back there, there's treasure there to figure it out and get in touch with that. And once you figure that part out, we'll take you to the next step. If you found value in this and this recap in this entire, what is now, I believe a one and a half hour session that you have gotten, highly encourage you again to visit the description, the link for the future pro group to both support yourself in your career and support the future so we can keep doing what we're doing. Until next time, we'll see you in the future. Peace.